to THA Talks for free thought and open minds. And for freedom of speech. Hello, I'm Paul Obertelli and welcome to another edition of THA Talks, the alternative podcast show from the UK. Our talks include news, conspiracies, spirituality, the occult, science, history, art, philosophy, religion and much more. If you'd like to check out our full archive, just go to www.thatalks.com to listen to or to download all our free content. And if there's anyone who'd like to contact us and give us some feedback, maybe you'd like to recommend a guest for the show, you can email us info at thatalks.com. And don't forget, you can subscribe to the show by our RSS feed and you can also find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube and many other podcast directories out there. Hello everybody, thank you for tuning in again here to THA Talks and Thanks for your comments on the last show with Russ James, the Socialist Motherland Party in edition 196. Something completely different today, and we're going to be speaking with Stephen M. Bland. I first came across Stephen at the last Extremist Clubs by David Parry, and I was very interested in some of the things he was bringing up. Um, We're talking kleptocracy and um, involving Russia and a lot of money laundering and this kind of stuff. Um, I thought it was very interesting in sort of how you can relate it to a lot of the propaganda that's being said about Russia and how it all ties in or how it doesn't tie in. Um, also, I'll probably have my, we'll probably have our differences, myself and Stephen, but hey, we met at, an, at a free speech club, so what can you say? Um, Stephen is he's a freelance jur- journalist, an award-winning author, travel writer and a researcher for the BBC, and I'm delighted to have him on the show. How are you doing, Stephen? I'm very well, thank you. Well, thank you for coming on. It's um, I thought your talk at the Extremist Club with David was brilliant. Um, and it just basically, I mean, you hear a lot of this, the, the conspiracies, because a lot, a, lot a lot of the stuff you were going into was regarding Russia and a lot of uh, certain corruption there. Um, and obviously we hear about the, the conspiracies in the media, which everyone's got a, an opinion about. But um, this stuff was a little bit more uh, um, something that's perhaps not as fun to read about in the media and, so, and exciting, but quite, quite, um, you know, quite um, important and relevant. Um, so before we go straight into it, let's let's come from the ground up. Um, um, let's let our listeners know about who you are and what you do and why you do what you do. OK, um, my name is Stephen M. Bland. I'm a freelance journalist. Uh, and author. I have a book out on Central Asia, and uh, I I have a bit of a history of becoming obsessed with quite obscure places. For about seven years, I was researching mostly about Laos, and then randomly I became interested in Central Asia, uh, went there on a whim, and four years of going there and back later, I completed a book about Central Asia. And for the last three and a half years since then, it's been backwards and forwards to the Caucasus, as I'm just completing a book about there. And um, from the research for the books, uh, many stories came out. And so I started to get more and more pieces published as a journalist and then get hired as an editor for people who write books from those regions and, uh, yeah, and get some, um, get some work as a researcher as well. So it was a bit of random introduction to the region, but uh, eight years down the line, I've learned quite a lot about it. Yeah, well, I mean, we we were in touch um, a few, like a, a month or uh, over a month back, and obviously that was before you were going away. So you've probably been researching so much other stuff since since I heard your talk that there's probably a lot of other material <laughs> that we can indulge in another time for that one because um, it's just been um, yeah we've we've had to wait to arrange this one. Um, but you, I mean, you've done the last extremist club with David Parry. Obviously, there was a bit of controversy with that club because of certain groups that wanted to attack it um wrongfully i might add um get t- basically taking yeah. the wrong idea of what it was all about so sadly that's well I, I think david parry will he'll always cook up something i'm sure he'll be back with another project with something like that but it was a great it was a great club where people could just get up and speak 
you hear people talk about things you don't normally hear about or you or stuff that you do but with someone with a lot of knowledge you can sit there and ask them questions directly and that that's what it was all about um so let's start off with i mean you you obviously done a talk there you had your 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 um you were prepared to do the talk let's break down what that talk was about and what what was the the research behind it it was i mean we're talking russia here but this is something a bit different than 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 uh, um the sort of 007 type conspiracies and stories we're hearing in the media um what's your views um w- what is it that you're talking about now um on that occasion um i'd spent quite a lot of time researching the case of mukhtar abliazov mm. who is a kazakh he'd like to think of himself as a political dissident but um there's 4.9 billion dollars of uk court judgments against him alone at the moment there are court cases going on against him in um, five, six other countries across the world at the moment. And um, although he's uh, subject to a 22-month prison sentence in Britain, which he fled the country to escape from, and because it was for contempt of court, we can't extradite him back, um, he's uh, living the high life in France at the moment. And going through like the taking the angle of the, of his story uh, in that particular speech i was looking at how his son madiar had got his golden visa to uh eventually become a uk citizen and um and looking at the blind faith period where we let 3000 people in with no due diligence done on them whatsoever because the government thought the banks were carrying out the due diligence and the banks thought the government was carrying out due diligence and nothing has been done in retrospect about any of these 3,000 people um, who are all under a veil of secrecy. And the Madiar Abliazov case was the first one where the veil of secrecy was broken because it became part of another court case as to where his money came from to buy his residency and then get his citizenship. Okay, so just just for the listeners that might not be with, with some of these terms, due diligence, due diligence you're talking about, um, basically checking where money's coming from. Is that right? That's, you know, making yeah, sure that that's, believe. yeah. So, I mean, this is, when people hear a conspiracy about Russia, a lot of it in the media, I mean, I don't know your, what, what are your views with the whole, you know, scenario with, with, with the, with the, with the chemical attacks or supposed chemical attacks or, and their support on Syria. I mean, where do you stand politically with that? Do you, are you, are you very, do you oppose Russia? Um, generally, or are you just um, coming across what you research and just following that? Um, I will just follow where the research takes me. I mean, it's reasonably well documented now that um, from the period of the Litvinenko poisoning, Mm. there were 13 extrajudicial murders on British soil, which were pretty much, you could say, carried out by Russia Mm. or by Russian mobsters. And the U.S. intelligence services were passing a lot of information over to Britain, saying that this was the case. We had uh, Poncha, the guy who brought up the evidence in the Litvinenko poisoning. Um, Apparently, he was ruled a suicide because he did a frenzied two-knife attack on himself. Mm. We had um, Scott Young, who was part of the Russian dissident Boris Berezovsky's circle. Like nine out of the 16 members of that circle are now dead. They were all deemed to be suicides. And in the case of Scott Young, um, he'd been telling people he was in fear of his life for many years because of the people he'd done business with. Um, and he was ruled a suicide, although the window in the apartment that he flew out of would only open by 50 centimetres. He would have to take a Superman dive to impale himself on the railings where his body was found. And the police never took any fingerprints or any photographs, including of the fingernail marks on the window ledge out of which he'd flown. Mm. Um, With the Scripple case, obviously we don't know enough yet, but uh, it's certainly been a politically expedient time for the government to change tack on how they're viewing Russia's extrajudicial activities. Would I mean? I mean, it, it all as as we were speaking about earlier off air. It's it's very complex and it can give it be very confusing. So many layers to this. Would we be right in saying that? Uh, I mean, that they the 
that with our government and our own authorities or secret services, there could be a lot of covering up of real conspiracies that are damaging the country and promoting ones that really are a bit more strange, if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. Um, we've chosen to ignore very clear evidence which has been handed to us on a plate by US authorities in, in these 13 cases. And I do think it just it's so expedient that this time we've chosen to make a stink about the scripples, whether it was Russia or not. It's just with the government in a complete mess and a meltdown about Brexit, it's uh, it's it's the, the timing is too expedient. Yeah. Well, it, it just seems, I mean, our government or, 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 or secret services, whatever you want to, however you want to look at it, but it seems like anything to do with 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 immigration bringing people that they they just use use any they they like to use any way like that, that they can just to damage this country in some way and then they cover up real issues that are going on and it's i mean this is and then people wonder why conspiracies start up and stuff so i mean let's let's go into um the money laundering and that sort of thing, like properties i remember this is something we were bringing up on on the, the um, extremist club um, how does this work then? What let's 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 um, um, for listeners that perhaps have no idea what we're talking about regarding this, let's pl- explain it from the ground up of how this is done and how damaging it is. Okay, um, like the last research that was done by Transparency International that came out in 2017, they identified 40,000 properties in London alone worth 4.4 billion who were owned by people whose the source of their wealth was suspicious, or we couldn't even say who owned those properties um, because they were owned by shell companies. So nobody knew who the beneficial owner of those places actually is. Um, This is another thing which ties back into the Abliazovs, as I was speaking about, as this is one of the few occasions where judgments have been passed that, they were owned by Mukhtar Abliazov and that he was the beneficial owner of the shell companies. And so his properties in London were seized. But uh, even the, the Home Affairs Select Committee report from 2016 says that £100 billion a year is being laundered through UK property. And this, this doesn't only... It's not only people who lose money to the kleptocrats who suffer... It's the people who are trying to get onto the property ladder, the people whose members of their communities are being forced out because they can no longer afford to live in those areas. And and it's led to something called the Lights Out London phenomenon, where places like um, Ennismore Gardens in NW, uh, SW7, uh, the majority of properties there are owned by kleptocrats who don't live there and don't let the properties out. Mm. And uh, so the, the place is just a, a ghost town. It's a, it's a neighborhood where you won't see anybody anymore. And 10 years ago, it was a really lively and vibrant part of London. Now it's just, just decimated because kleptocrats are hiding their money there. Mm. I, it, it just seems, uh, I mean, obviously, I think with Russia, like Ru- um, M- Russian math, Russia mafia and and whatnot, it's, it's, it's like there's so much layers of of mafia there anyway i mean there's there's probably some that the government do know about and use and some that they don't and it's almost like the country are just using that um as a to 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 ignore it ignore the real issues what we're talking about now and then also to hype uh, conspiracies that perhaps put them in a position where they can sanction russia or do, you know I'm, it just seems as if the, the uk really have it in for russia at the moment and why aren't they using this stuff that you're talking about now, which is genuinely, you know, like you could literally put it, put the facts on on a, on a, on, a, on files underneath people's noses and say, here it is, this is it. And they're not doing that. You, you know, it's that, that's the kind of the strange thing. They're making up these crazy conspiracies that some people fear, you know, are they trying to poke the bear here, start a war with Russia? Or they've got mm. genuine stuff that you you're talking about now to do it. Um I mean, do you smell a conspiracy there in in terms of this money laundering? There must be there must be some serious reason why they don't want to um, really talk about this. And I mean, the media are the media really touching? To, I mean, you, I mean, you research for the BBC. What, what I mean, I don't know if you're allowed to tell us what what's the, are the BBC reporting on this a lot, or is it something they're just not not interested in? Um. Well, 
There is movement on this, finally. Um, it was first uh, at a anti-money laundering um, a series of events in London in 2016. David Cameron promised uh, a list of beneficial owners of properties in London. And then we had, uh, well, that was around the time of the Panama Papers. And then we had the Paradise Papers and still nothing was happening. But now we have some movement on it because the, a provision of the Criminal Finances Act uh, is unexplained wealth orders. And they've come into force since uh, January of this year. And they will allow the government to um, basically, if somebody has assets worth £50,000 or more, and they've clearly not got the salary to have the assets they own, um, we can now look into the source of their suspicious wealth. Mm. Now, it just depends if this will be used, because at the moment, uh, to the best of my knowledge, and again, this is something which is which is rather hidden, because when we start to use this, we really need the first big case to be a success. If the first case is a failure, it brings into question the whole uh, unexplained wealth order provision of the Criminal Finances Act. But there are two cases moving forward, and we don't know who they are against at the moment. It's rumoured that one of them is a Central Asian, and the other one we don't know. But uh, slow progress. Hopefully, mm. finally, some movement on trying to find out um, who whose money is uh, is swishing around in the economy here. But um, and I've talked to people like uh, Lord Lord Saltair. Um, who was the head of the House of Lords for years. And even he said to me, there's been very little political will to tackle this because this, this Russian money and CIS money has been a mainstay of the economy here for so long. And it's been so beneficial to, uh, um, like so many big estate agents, for example, mm. that uh, there's just not been a will to tackle it um there was a really interesting um roman borisovich um who has an ngo called clamp k who have been trying to get the government to look into this for years he did a documentary in 2015 called um from russia with cash mm. and uh he went around five high-end properties and secretly filmed the estate agents as he was going around them and made it clear that his money would have to be hidden and it was from dubious sources and not one of them turned him down. In fact, one of them said uh, 80% of his transactions were now to international clients and about 60% of those were in stages of anonymity. And once you get into these webs of shell companies, you will find that people have created perhaps 10 different companies just to hide one mm. because the web becomes so complex that uh, it becomes impossible to, to trace the money back. Uh, but again, we have some movement on this now because we are drawing up if it goes through and there is some doubt about it still in 2021, there's supposed to be uh, for properties in the UK, a register of beneficial owners coming out. To anyone wanting to buy a property here, it will have to be shown exactly who the real owner of that is. But um, I know there's still, I've spoken to many investigative journalists who uh, are still very dubious that this will come to pass. It's something that the government tried to stop right until the last minute when it was clear that there was a, a big enough backbench rebellion that it was going to pass anyway. And so they pulled the vote and went along with it. Right. Okay. So, um, I mean, what about the um, the EU and stuff? Because aren't they meant to be quite hot on if there's anything that a nation is doing, you know, wrong with the economy? It's it's ultimately going to affect them as well. Have they have they been open about this, or have they also acted suspiciously? Um. Well, we're not even the worst in terms of this. I mean, you would be looking at Cyprus, Malta, Portugal all have even more lax regulations than we do in Britain. And um, the last thing I was doing um, on this after the Abliazovs was the Krapunovs. Now, mm -hmm. Viktor Krapunov was the mayor of Almaty. 
and um, he is he's charged with embezzling somewhere between three hundred and six hundred million dollars. Now he's been um, resident in Geneva since he fled Kazakhstan, and in Switzerland it's it's done by Canton, not even on a national level. And uh, the Swiss are very eager to have this money flowing through the economy, particularly in Geneva. And their their regulations are extremely lax. <clears throat> um, yeah, let me see. So I was talking to Martin Hilty. He's the executive right. director of Transparency International Switzerland. Right. And he said that... Uh, Yes, Switzerland's very low down. There are several loopholes in the Anti-Money Laundering Act um, because it's only limited to financial intermediaries. It doesn't really take account of real estate. The main actors in the process there are notaries and estate agents, but the duty of due diligence is down to the banks. But They're so far removed from the process that they cannot detect money laundering. Um, so... Within two years of fleeing Kazakhstan for Switzerland, the Krapanovs were named amongst the wealthiest families in the country. Mm. And all of that money is money that was embezzled out of, oh, we should say, uh, allegedly embezzled out of Almaty. Um, through, through things like um, taking kickbacks to give away government land, um, selling off environmentally protected areas, even selling off a uh, kindergarten and a hospital for um, war veterans. And this was, and effectively it happens like this in a lot of places. Um, the company was sold to a shell. The shell company inherit the provisions of what they must do. So they must invest more. They must give more back to the environment. But then when they sell on the contract to another shell, he sells it again and again, the provisions don't follow the sale. And then when it's sold back to the Krapanov family again, who can then sell it for its proper price, all of the stipulations which were attached in the first place are gone. Mm. So basically they were able to do things like um, buy um, state property and flip it the next day at 45 times the price that they bought it for, by which time it passed through five shell companies. Blimey. I mean, this is, uh, we, we talk about issues going on in, in around Europe and people's, and with nations' economies and stuff. I mean, this stuff is just, it's, um, I mean, when, when you research, is, do, you see a, do you see a time where this could be stopped, or is it something that's just so ingrained um, in, in so many nations that it's just something that would take so many years to really it, it, get rid of if you could? Um, we need more political will globally mm. because even if Britain does become a strong actor against this, which as I say is still up in the air, mm. um, just and already we're seeing people want, wanting to invest less here not just because of Brexit and the uncertainty about that, but because they know that it's possibly going to become more difficult for them to hide their money and property here. But that just means that they'll go to Portugal and the Netherlands is very weak on this as well. So the money will just flow elsewhere. And uh, see, at the moment in America, at the top of the tree there, you've got Donald Trump. I, I did an in infographic about Donald Trump's mm. links to oligarchs. Yeah. And I got up to uh, 81 known connections to dubious oligarchs, many of whom are banned from America, but all of who's done business with. Right. So not really a leading light there. Right. Well, the thing, I mean, he's just, I mean, whether whoever supports or hates Donald Trump, one thing, he's just money business. I think that's, he'd always put that ahead of anything. I mean, there's certainly, I mean, what, what about the likes of Corbyn and stuff? Has he, has he addressed it or... Um, off the top of my head, Labour would take a much firmer position against this, but I, I can't say as I've come across that because um, I'm more looking into what what is definitely already happening, not what maybe is going to happen in the future. And uh, 
opposition policy can tend to be a bit of a blank slate because until you have to put out that manifesto and implement it, yeah, with the position on Brexit, it can be easier to just sit back and uh, and let the government of the time dig themselves a deeper hole. I, gu- I guess the problem is is it's one of those things that. Although it's an obvious problem, it's not a problem that everyone knows and understands. So it's very difficult for a party to say, we're going to get rid of this, you know, get rid of um, um, kleptocracy, all this stuff, um, you know, and expect to win, win an election through it because most people are going, what's that? You know, what's, I don't, that's, is that affecting me? They don't really understand it. So it's, it's not a sellable um, thing to put in your manifesto. Do you know what I mean? It's, this is the problem. Yeah. It, it needs to, it needs to come out and people understand the issues of it. Would, also, would you say, is could this be, I mean, I don't know the ins and outs of it. I know roughly what it is. And that's why I've, I've, I was finding you very interesting listening to you tell me all about it in the in the extremist club. But it, could it be something that Russia's doing deliberately to have more control over certain econ- economies, even if it's done in, in this sort of strange way, like under underhand way? Could, could it be a tactic from Putin? Or is, do you think it's just too... too uh, um, complicated for for it to be controlled like that way um so it, it depends where um say in the uk you've got a pretty even mixture of putin acolytes and and uh and people who have fallen out with putin who own um properties here but uh in the case of somewhere like ukraine they um they've certainly gutted the economy there and it was done very deliberately and it was an extremely long-term plan. Um, there was a big meeting in 1995, which was arranged by Boris Bernstein, mm. um, who Trump has done business with also with his son, Alexander Schneider. Um, Bernstein was a, he changes nationality at the lot. At the moment, he's Canadian, and he's Canadian mining company, Cbeco, does a lot of business in the CIS states. Uh, Burstein, <clears throat> at the time, was um, the main advisor to the first independent president of Kyrgyzstan. Um, and, short, and he had his ear, and he wowed him, and he brought uh, Canadian trade delegations over there. And his biggest opponent was the Kyrgyz prime minister, who died in very mysterious circumstances. And shortly afterwards, 14 of the 16 tons of gold in the Kyrgyz reserves went missing. The Kyrgyz government would say that that was on a private plane with Boris Burstein. Now, after this, Boris Burstein arranged a meeting of top mafia dons in Tel Aviv, at which um, Semyon Mogilevich was present uh, he's been on the fbi's top 10 wanted list for upwards of 20 years now uh he's always been shielded by putin uh, they have a lot of uh, business contacts um in common um some say they're actually quite good friends and at that meeting in 95 they effectively agreed how they were going to divvy up ukraine um, which they went on to do, and this is part of what Paul Manafort and Rick Gates and some of the, the Trump people that are going down at the moment were incredibly implicit in making that carve-up happen. So, yes, it completely, completely depends on where in the world, to answer your question in a roundabout way. Okay, I mean, so let's, I mean, what about other nations? Are there other nations that are doing similar things, like someone like Saudi Arabia did? Do we get a lot of Saudi Arabians coming over doing the same thing? Or is it distinctly, I mean, is it really predominantly Russian um, coming from Russia? Certainly in terms of um, golden visas, as they're known. Mm. And at the time I was talking about you had to invest £1 million, which you got back. Uh now they've put it up to two million pounds and sort of beefed up the due diligence slightly. And in terms of that, it's actually come to the point now where more Chinese people get that than than Russians. Mm. Um, in terms of hiding money in property, because it's so well hidden, it's very difficult to say. And this is why it would be so interesting if, if this register of beneficial owners comes to pass. 
then we'll know who is hiding their money here. But um, at the moment, the, the, the information that comes out is a trickle. Right. It's just, I mean, I am a conspiracy man. I'm always looking for a, a layers here. So it's, it couldn't be, because obviously you hear so much stuff in the media that, that, that you know, if if there was a uh, if there was a, a, a hurricane, it was Putin's fault. You know, you, you so you begin to get <laughs> sceptical of it. And it's just, it's not it's the same with a lot any any controversial political figure seems to just get get it to be honest with you. So it's like, it, it, is it possible that this could be um, framing? You know, that there's there's someone with a lot of money um, somewhere that's doing this, and it actually, you know, we we're, we're, we're talking about Russians, but it, the, the source of the money is coming from somewhere else. Is that possible? It's it's possible. But I would say it's likely that most of it is CIS money. Mm. And the reason I say that really is because in, after the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, Russia was really looking towards the West, as was China at the time, and they wanted reproachment. And, uh, and we continued to treat them as a Cold War enemy. There was not the appetite here for that. and. Um, those countries effectively became well, bandit states for quite a while. Um, it was a new Wild West out of which the oligarchs rose. And it's just because that is more recent and the division of wealth was more rapid and you, be you got a lot more um, new power brokers. And especially people that have fallen foul or fear they might fall foul of the regimes there so in a lot of cases people that uh, that are against putin um that needed to hide their money and to hide it rapidly in case they did fall foul of the regime so it couldn't be the likes of i mean i know it's become a, a little bit of a cliche but there's certainly um, no smoke without fire the likes of soros it couldn't be someone like him pulling these strings um I personally wouldn't think so, and I'm not saying he's he's whiter than snow, but uh, I don't think so personally. No. Yeah. Okay, so we're obviously hearing everything, you know, Brexit, Brexit, Brexit going on. You've also you you've touched on the fact that, that a lot of these, um, in some ways, they fear um, after Brexit it could take money out of the country because because of the uh, transparency of it. Generally mm. speaking, do you think Brexit would be a good thing? I mean, I. And some some people don't like to say, "Are you a Brexiteer or are you a um, a Remain?" If you don't mind me asking, I am an avid Remainer. I think Brexit will be a disaster for the country. Right. Um, as a person that has to travel a lot for my work, I've already seen the pound lose twenty to twenty two percent of its value, and so traveling on assignments become ridiculously more expensive for me. Mm. We're seeing every week more companies moving out of the UK and not just threatening to, but physically leaving. We're saying we have no flight plans in place with 150 countries once Brexit happens. Um, I just see it as an unmitigated disaster, to be honest. Yeah, well, I mean... And would you? I mean, would you say that could also be because of the uncertainty that that it's just people don't know what's going on that a lot of this is happening rather than the actual because obviously because we're not out of the EU yet, there's no real way to counterbalance the benefits of Brexit because it's like it's almost like we're at the moment experiencing the negative sides because people are just thinking they don't know what's going on and none of the the the, the benefits you get from leaving like um, other trade deals that we can negotiate ourselves. Um, do you think that might have anything to do with that as well? Or? The EU are our biggest trade partners by a mile. It's in no way good for the EU to negotiate a good exit deal with us because mm -hmm. it will lead to more countries possibly thinking, well, they got a great deal. Why don't we do it? And then once we go, I mean, do our ex-trading partners in the EU really need us? And we've already seen America wants to negotiate a trade deal. It's madness what's going on with the sanctions at the moment mm. um, and the tariffs. But they're more interested in making a trade deal with the EU. Australia are more interested in trade deals with the EU. 
Yeah. What have we managed to forge so far? A trade deal with some countries in the south of Africa, which constitute 0.4% of our trading partners. And with with relation to, I mean, to go on to the, to the point about with relation to the money laundering and stuff, wouldn't that benefit, though, Brexit, even though, yeah, it might not benefit the economy, but in terms of a cleaner economy, wouldn't that be a case? Um, well, no, the, the two are, are not related whatsoever. Right. I mean, at the, I mean, at the moment, although we're looking at this register of beneficial owners and Brexit is on the horizon, the government are still trying to dilute EU anti-tax haven legislation that's going through at the moment. So... Um, what what do you think is going to happen? Uh, um, uh, this, sorry, um, strange. It's a surprising time, and I, I think it's been brought about by this like scripple bomb that's mm. gone off that we're tackling this at this very moment. Because if anything, this is a time when the government really could use this dirty Russian money flowing around in the economy, because a lot of other money is going to be pulling out. So it's it's. Uh, yeah, it's an odd time for us to be tackling it, but um, I think it's just the the waves from from the Scripple attack have gone have gone too far, and uh, it had to be done now. Otherwise, the the, the whole anti Russian position would have looked weak. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, I, I know you're a researcher. You you probably um, don't like to make statements you can't prove and so on. But I mean, you yourself, when you hear the stories of the chemical attacks in Syria, the, 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 the attacks here on, on UK turf. Um, do, do you believe it or do you think that there's a, 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 like a, 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 an alternative motive for our government to make this stuff up and to maybe drive it? In, in Syria, I couldn't say. Um, both sides obviously have an agenda to push and uh, there's not really enough room for free and clear journalism on the ground to verify or deny anything. With the, the attacks that have gone on here, I would think in the, in the cases that I was talking about before, the 13 murders, the evidence is too strong. With the Scripple one, it, it's very up in the air and it's impossible to say at the moment. It, just, it would seem like a very strange target for the Russians to have gone after. I mean, these are people that uh, that surely didn't pose a threat anymore, I'd, unless they've done something to offend some mafiosos, yeah. in which case, did the word come from on high? And it's so close to Porton Down as well, and it's not, it's not the only instance of a chemical leak we've had around there. Yeah, I mean, it just, it just seems really strange to me that you'd have um, if 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 Russia wanted to attack these people, why they would use that chemical agent? Because if if they can if it can only be traced back to Russia, then they knew that you know they they're not stupid. They're not going to say, oh, we'll get away with it. They'll they'll say, well, they'll be able to trace it trace it back. So what they're ultimately saying is Russia have deliberately killed these people with this chemical so that we would deliberately know it's them, and uh, it it just becomes it becomes very confusing and Ill illogical. And and then when you look at in Syria, where Assad is is on the front foot in in many regards with Russian support, and you've actually got the rebels that are in a desperate position, and then he uses a chemical attack which he knows everyone's going to see. He knows he's already been told off um, previous for supposedly using it before, and it, again, it's just why on earth? It, it's just constant thing with think uh, claims that lack common sense to it. Um, so if I mean if it is true. Then it, there's there's something very strange going on behind it. That's that's how I see it. I mean, whatever you may think of Putin, and I was just in Russia uh, about a week ago. The people there still love him very, very much indeed. You'll still see people wearing Putin T-shirts everywhere. Um, but whatever you may think of him, he's a schemer and he thinks things through. He never acts rashly, and and so to attribute acts to him which don't seem to have any common sense behind them, 
that's not the way he acts mm. and that's he's politically savvy that's why he's survived so long and is still so popular mm. it's i mean it's um it is difficult to know because obviously yeah the British was saying well, he's doing this to i'm just waiting for the motive i'm waiting for why is he doing this you know and as i said i mean you've got a lot of this stuff that you've dug up about about with the money laundering and this kind of stuff um why you know that's that's something you know so it shows they only want to really attack him for certain things and not other things so that it shows an agenda on both parts i i think that i'm just going to watch this like a hawk you know that's the way i see it and see how it unfolds each way because it's certain i don't think we've heard the last of any of this you know no absolutely yeah so um right well we won't get back into the brexit debate because that will take up another hour we can maybe have you back on the show to do a brexit thing especially <laughs> especially over the next few months as it's going to unfold I, I actually want to do a round table and have to be a referee for that one um and we go into that but is there anything else that you'd like to touch on regarding um, what we've been talking about anything you'd like to to bring up no, no, I mean, unless, unless we want to get into Trump and the oligarch ties, which is a massive subject on itself, uh, I think we've sort of done, done a fair share on the British side of it there. Okay, well, well let's say, um, I mean, I've, I've, um, when, when Trump won the election, I kind of said I, I supported his anti-establishment and position which in itself anti-establishment it has a lot of layers to what that actually means but pretty much against the grain whether whether he's in his own he's in his own swamp um i certainly think he's trying to drain a swamp i don't know whether he's draining the swamp he's he comes from but it, it just seemed quite a, a swing away from the norm at least what you could say and i said to myself well i'm going to wait a year two years and then i'll, I'll judge and I think certainly from that that point, what we can include is the the hysteria is at least we can say this: the hysteria seems to be un, unwarranted. You know, it, it was there were so many people saying he's going to destroy the country. At this point, I think it could be in a it could be in a worse situation. But obviously, I mean, here we'd like to hear you know go into other sides of the other other sides point of view on Trump. Obviously, there's a lot of people that hate him. Some people, I think hate him and they're just being too over emotional with it and just throwing their own feelings at, at this but i'm not saying that there's not any you know um common sense grounds and people that have genuine concerns about where he's coming from so what i mean mm. what what's your views on on trump's um input here um the thing is with Trump is that uh, by the early 90s, he'd been declared bankrupt five times. Nobody was prepared to lend to him anymore. I mean, he plays on being a great businessman, but he's not actually. He, If he would uh, sat around and did needlepoint, he would be richer than he is now, just sitting on his inherited fortune. Mm. And when you look at the people he's surrounded himself with, People who are starting to go down already now, like Rick Gates, Paul Manafort, Michael Cohen, um, he's and all through his contacts, he's done business with a lot of crooks. And yeah, as I was touching on earlier, when I was uh, researching his links to oligarchs, I found 81 people, many who have banned from the US, like uh, the aluminium. Uh, magnet Oleg Deripaska, who can't even get a visa to get into America, and is a really good friend of Putin. Now, I'm not saying there's any direct Putin Trump links, despite Trump in 2013 saying that Putin was his new best friend. Mm. But the contacts through the links are indisputable, and some of the people that people like Rick Davis and Paul Manafort, even Jared Kushner, have done business with. Donald Trump Jr. has done business with and then lied about. It does not sit well with me. Um, one of the things which is on the periphery of the Mueller probe is his relation to Felix Sater. Now, Felix Sater um, first did jail time for stabbing somebody in the neck and the face with a stub of a margarita glass in a bar brawl then perpetrated $40 million worth of stock fraud out of a Trump-owned property on Wall Street. Um, but 
this was all um, the second offence he didn't do any jail time for because it was part of a settlement in which he agreed to turn evidence on Russian mobsters. Felix Sater himself is the son of a Russian mobster who was one of the dons of Semyon Mogilevich, who, as I've said, has been on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list for 20 years. Now, Donald Trump then went on through the Trump Organization to do business with Felix Sater in numerous projects. Um, the Trump Soho project was with Bayrock. Felix Sater was running the company at the time. And the Krapanovs, who I spoke of earlier, actually bought and flipped a lot of condos in that, three condos, three, she three shell companies, the money from which was stolen and which they moved through Felix Sata. Um, <clears throat> there was the... Let me see. Um, there was a deal on some um, real estate in... Phoenix, uh, which was done with a guy called Menez, who is part of a sealed settlement as well, who Felix Sater threatened to uh, electrocute his testicles and leave him dead in the boot of a car. Oh, now, dear. after all this happened, and this could still blow back onto Trump, because if Trump knew that Felix Sater was um, a criminal at the time this was happening and was still in attracting investors despite this there's a 10 year uh, there's there are 10 years to prosecute him for this and that expires in 2021 but after all this had happened felix sater was hired by the trump organization as a senior advisor they also hired a guy called daniel ridloff who is also um moved um, a lot of dirty money, of crap and of money, which was tied in with Ablias of money, which was all part of freezing orders worldwide. And <clears throat> these are just some examples of the type of people that Trump surrounds himself with. Mm. And we've seen 16 of them indicted so far. And that will only expand. Um yeah, like Carter yeah. Page is linked to Dimitri Firtash. Dimitri Firtash is trying to escape extradition in Austria at the moment, holding up a court case there. Um, he has acted as a front for Semyon Mogilevich as well. So the, the ties, the, if it's not Trump, then the people he's surrounded himself with speak of incredibly poor choices. Mm. Okay, well, I mean, this is uh, as um, we could go. We could go on for another hour with Trump because he's just one of them people you could just talk about for a long time. There's so many angles yeah. you could take. Um, what wh we're just about to round it up. So yeah, that, that's great. I mean, we, we obviously on the show we've promoted a lot of um, populist movements and this sort of thing. But we always like to have everyone else's opinion on there. I'd just like to add as well. You are a supporter of free speech. That's why you've done the the, the, the extremist club which changed its Absolutely. name to the Free Speech Club. So I'm assuring our listeners that you're on, well on board with us on that, on that case. Just to round it up, what do you think of the QAnon conspiracy that's beginning to grow and grow? Um, does it interest you? Have you researched it? In, have you looked into it much? Um, I Sorry, I, I don't know anything about that. No. What were you referring oh. to? I, well, it's, this is something you should definitely check out here on the show. This is an exclusive. I'm... I'm um, Letting you know about this, it's 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 a conspiracy that came that's been going on for about a year or so, which is um, an online presence which claims to be this kind of underground coop, which is not really politically aligned, but is at, at the moment working through the Trump administration through these Brexit movements. It's obviously something that you would be suspicious with because obviously you're you're not a Brexiteer and you and you don't like Trump, but. It's basically, it's quite an interesting movement because they're making predictions, some of which has come true. And um, ultimately, it's drifted over into this side of the Atlantic, um, not the same movement, but a connected movement called British Fight, which again, their, their goal is to actually create um, a, a party which uh, brings a lot of parties together to try and take out the top two and, and just to change the whole paradigm of it so maybe this is something i mean obviously a lot of people don't follow it and don't don't get into the conspiracy side of it much but it is growing so 
I'd recommend you check that out and maybe next time you come on the show we can we can talk a little bit about that um because it's something that's certainly out there and uh as I said it is isn't politically aligned although at the moment it may have the look like it's it's a more pro um, conservative movement but um the british fight side of it it has been talking to a lot of different movements um but yeah i thought i'd let the you know I, if you if you did know about that i'd have been interested to to hear your thoughts on it um no i mean it'll certainly be difficult to dislodge the major two parties on this or that side of the Atlantic because they've just been so ingrained for such a long time. Mm. Well, uh, then it used to be the Liberals who were the main party and look what happened to them. So yeah. anything's possible. Well, it, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's linked a lot with the claims of this, a lot of this pedophilia that's going on. That he claims it's that Hollywood's ingrained with it and, and um, the government. And there's been a lot of kind of underground good blackmailing if you can if you if that's a real thing you know kind of that they've been exposing the bad guys and saying we've got videos of this and that um who who knows i mean i've promoted it on this show because it's intriguing and some of it is really interesting because some of it seems that a lot of predictions come true with it and it's just something interesting to follow because it always seems to go somewhere and to hold strength and it's it's made it in the media i mean a lot of media that they've debunked it and this and that but have they really but um, but anyway, I thought um, I thought I'd hit, hit check out your views on it. If you haven't, I recommend you check it out because it it might um, at least it, it will make you uh, anyone that's not into Trump. It, it can at least give an insight into the movement that supports Trump and why they support Trump and what it is they're really um, what their real concerns are are about. Um, whether Trump, I mean, in some ways, it could um, a lot of QAnon supporters believe that you know Trump's the hero because he's a part of it. But in some ways, um, if if QAnon conspiracy is true, then there could be a lot of people that aren't particularly great themselves. But they've said, you know what? We know you've done this. We know you've done that. You're a dirt. You're you you're, you know your history's dirty. But we know people who's done a lot lot worse. So you play. You do what we say, and um, we'll 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 give you a get out of jail free card. But as long as we get these these are other criminals, you know. So a little bit of that kind of thing, perhaps. But um, but yeah, there you go. It, that's that's how I, what I thought would um, round the shop. Is is there anything you'd like to add before we wrap it up? Um, no, I'll I'll certainly look into that. I'm seeing just on the internet here that that Trump's had some White House meetings with some QAnon people, but uh, it, it's new to me. Is it is it a deep state kind of conspiracy? Yes, it's it's. I mean, in some, I'll be honest with you. There's been times where I've said it's a load of rubbish. They've made they've made predictions that haven't come true. So therefore, it's rubbish. But it just seems to be the overall narrative that they talk about things, and then a few months later, the general shape of what they're talking about, which means I'm pretty convinced whoever it is is genuinely connected. It's just a case of are they genuinely connected with with something that's good and beneficial or not. Um, I think a good example of I mean, if you look at um, um, uh, Julian Assange from WikiLeaks, like. A few a, f- a few years ago, he was quite pro left wing because he was exposing a lot of republic uh, republicans and and uh, exposing their crimes. And then, obviously, now it's turning. He's exposing more of the Democrats and so on. And I think um, it, over time, people will realise. I don't think it is a. Uh, I mean, Trump himself before he became a Republican, if you were to guess who he was, he probably would have been a Democrat. You know, in terms of what he says openly and politically. Um, not, I wouldn't certainly wouldn't say he was on the you know, the socialist side, but more left leaning the right, and then he runs for for Republicans. So there's a lot of strange stuff, and also along the line, there's a lot of people, a lot of famous people, um, that seem to have sort of turned on a turned on a coin and on, on how they view about Trump or or, or that sort of movement. Kanye West was um, one of them. Um, very strange. All of a sudden, he's on board. What's he heard behind the scenes? What's what someone had a what someone said in his ear? So. Um, but yeah, any, any listeners as well, if if you if you want to uh, um, research it, it's fascinating stuff. Um, maybe it will get proven to be something that isn't, but at the moment it seems to be. It certainly seems to be gathering, um, flying on its wings at the moment. Okay. Do you think there will be an uh, attempt at impeachment if the Democrats take the House in the midterms? Um, well, I think it's clear that that um, 
the the Democrats want to do anything they can to impeach him. I mean, the thing is with me, it's 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 the the last few presidents have been pretty corrupt, you know. And it's I think at the moment, if if I was to look at what Trump's doing for the country and stuff, I think uh, I think the Democrats should be looking more really at why Trump has been voted in. You know, what is it? What is it that people say? I'm going to vote Trump because of this. And and compete with them that way. I think they should compete and say, well, okay, let's listen to the people. We know we know, they know their values, and they need to reach out. I think they're making that mistake. I think they're they're not listening to the movement, the populist movement. Don't have to agree with everything they say, but you know, for that many people to vote for him, there must be some arguments that they're genuine fears and concerns from these people. And for that reason, I, I, it wouldn't surprise me if if Trump wins the midterms and and that because it, they haven't really changed the tune since he won the election, and everyone was surprised that he won the election apart from the Trump supporters. They said, "Well, we 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 think we're gathering momentum here." So, you know, I'm me myself. I'm not. I'm more conservative socially. Um, over the years, I've become more conservative in how I view view society around me because of how how much progressive politics have stepped up and, and there's there's been some good things and some bad things but um but generally i think people are becoming more conservative just because certain directions going on it's making them want to slam the brakes on and that's generally more, more a way of thinking with a more conservative mind and um so that would be my view on that i don't i don't know but certainly i think they'll try anything they can get but i think it's it's a corrupt presence doing that because i think you know if there's a lot of smart democrats out there a lot of they've got a lot of power a lot uh, uh, you know they're not they're not idiots and i think they should really be challenging politically and and talking to trump supporters as if you know we we're talking to you you know we want to know what you think this is what we think but that's not going on they're still calling them the de- deplorables de- uh, deplor- um, tongue tied now but you know you, you know where i'm coming from Yes, yeah, I do. And um, I think it's such a shame that they ran with Hillary Clinton at the last election. I mean, as someone that's more left leaning, because uh, she was the absolute embodiment of the establishment. And it was so clear that people would not come out to vote for her, whereas the Trump supporters could envisage him as some harbinger of change. No matter what you think of him, he certainly was not part of that traditional establishment. It'll be really interesting to see when it does roll around towards 2019 and they have to pick their candidate, who the Democrats will run with this time. Mm. I think they do need to, to come up with somebody a bit more left field. Yeah, I've Someone that can, that can engage voters because they're not just the same ruling family. They're not the next Clinton along. They're not, a, you know, like... Before that, you had uh, in the Republican side, you had Bush and Bush, and yeah, you know, yeah. Have an appetite for change, and it'll be interesting to see if they can embrace that. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, that's that's a fair point. I th- I think generally there's too much emphasis in left and right. I, mean, I think left and right. I mean, there's there's still far right and there's still far left, but generally politics it's it's become it's it's changed over the years, and I think. Um, um, when, when you talk about populist movements, I think they consist on a lot of right wingers and a lot of left wingers. It's just um, objecting to the direction globally, what's going on, and uh, and that's it. And I, my prediction is whether whether this QAnon thing is a real conspiracy. I think populism in itself. I think over time people will realise that there's there's more than a left and right thing to it. It's it's um, there's going to be more issues brought into it because there's going to be more issues unfold. Um, but that would be my prediction in a way. But um, we are just about out of time and stuff. So I'd like to thank you for coming on the show and just give you one more, you know, just to give you the last word, so to speak. Yes, yeah, so thanks for having me. It's been um, been good to talk. And uh, yeah, clearly we've got some different opinions on stuff. But as you say, we, we came across each other at the uh, at the Free Speech Club. And it, it is good when people from across the political spectrum can come together and discuss their opinions and not just become embedded and entrenched in their position so that there can't be a dialogue anymore and anywhere that promotes that sort of free speech is a, is a fine a fine vehicle indeed well yeah i mean when any political move if they lose as long as they can um, do so in the knowledge that their opposition respects certain 
you know values British values you've got free speech and that then you know at least not all's lost so uh, we'll see what happens in the future and thanks again for coming on Stephen you're always welcome back on the show and perhaps after some more research you've been you've been doing I know you're doing a lot of it and um, come back on the show and talk to us about something else super love team